You're listening to Road to Resilience. I'm John Earl. Comedian Daryl Hammond was a regular cast member on Saturday Night Live for 14 seasons. His spot-on impressions of Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Sean Connery, and many others made millions laugh. But behind the scenes, Daryl was suffering. Drug and alcohol abuse, debilitating flashbacks, and self-harm were just a few of his symptoms. Forty doctors over 40 years misdiagnosed him with a range of mental illnesses. But it was only after a suicide attempt in his early 50s that he was diagnosed with the true source of his symptoms, childhood trauma. Daryl's journey of survival and resilience is explored in a new documentary film about the long-term effects of childhood trauma called Cracked Up. It's directed and produced by Michelle Esrick, who's also a trauma survivor. Here's a clip from the trailer. A psychiatrist, I think it was number 11, said that I was a manic depressive. You are schizophrenic. I might be a multiple personality. Nine psychiatric facilities, including lockdown. Well, I'll just give him these pills. He goes, well, let's face it, you are a nut. (laughs) He made me laugh. He's like, I'm joking with you because you're not any of these things. You are this way because of something that happened to you. Today on the podcast, an honest conversation about trauma, complex PTSD, and healing, featuring Daryl Hammond, director Michelle Esrick, and psychologist Dr. Jacob Hom. Dr. Hom is director of the Center for Child Trauma and Resilience at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Now, to be clear, he's not Daryl's doctor. He's a specialist who agreed to help us facilitate this conversation. Daryl, Michelle, and Dr. Hom talk about trauma on the granular level what it feels like, how to conceptualize it, how to tackle it every day, and how to support the survivors in all of our lives. One more thing before we start. In the recording, Daryl references a Dr. Kotby. That's Dr. Nabil Kotby of Weill Cornell Medicine, the one who changed Daryl's life when he correctly diagnosed him with childhood trauma. We begin our conversation by talking about the long-term health effects of childhood trauma. Studies have linked adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, with a wide range of adult ailments. Some you might expect, like substance abuse, while others, like cancer and even heart disease, you might not. Daryl, can you talk about the ways that childhood trauma affected you as an adult? Um, Cutting. I was a a lifetime cutter. I I started actually cutting when I was uh, 19, and I cut until about uh, the age of uh, 50... I'm going to say 53, maybe. Yeah. And other symptoms, you had flashbacks and oh, alcoholism. We didn't even start with that. Yeah. I mean, night terrors and screaming at night and cutting yourself is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. There's a quote where you say, the last person that's going to be good at loving someone is going to be me. <laughs> yeah. That'd be about right. It's going to be really hard for me. I mean, if if the person that nature designed to love you has made concerted movements towards, if not killing you, certainly torturing you, I'm going to come up a little wonky, a little wobbly <laughs> in love relationships, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jacob, I was wondering whether you could offer... The last some... thing, and then I'll shut sure, up. Sure, please. I want someone... I, I mean, I want to hear about people in AA and, and people, the drug addicts and alcoholics and the percentage of them that are trauma survivors. That's all. That's my, that's all I'm done. Sir. Yeah. Some of, some of your uh, experience in the relationship between trauma and, and relationships that, that you've come across as a clinician. Um, I, I wish I could give you the stats for how many people. I assume all of them. I assume that uh, there's way more trauma than we are documenting. Um, when I was listening to your answer about the symptoms, I don't think that captures the nature of what trauma does to a person as an adult. I, I, I feel like that the, the list of symptoms immediately makes us devoid of what it's like. Like it immediately makes us not get the experience of living with trauma. Um, what I personally think the essence of what trauma does to a person is it just makes them 
feel like they don't deserve love. That's such a profound injury, and we can't bypass how painful that is. Why would you not kill yourself if you don't feel like the person who's supposed to love you unconditionally doesn't? What's the point of being alive if you can't be loved by that one person? <laughs> that, uh, that nails it. Yeah. That nails it. And I think that um, the field still focuses too much on big T traumas, like physical abuse or like sexual abuse. Right. But it's the day-to-day neglect that I find to be the most insidious and the most profound. Right. And the most impactful on a person's ability to have a like a loving relationship with another adult as a human being. Yes. You don't need the other stuff. That's just gravy compared to the yeah. neglect. Yeah, that's already atomic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's just going to change everything that ever happens to you for the rest of your life. Yeah. That's my point, that the trauma happens moment to moment. Moment to moment. It's not just these big events. A thousand moments, a million moments, moment to moment. Right. I think the moment to moment is really brilliant. Yeah. 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 Because everybody wants to focus on Daryl's mother, which is obvious, but nobody that we talk to ever wants to mention the effects from his father. And... um, I remember we did a radio show, I won't mention which one, and the person interviewing us said, well, he didn't hit him. So the father didn't, in his mind, the father didn't do anything because he didn't hit him. Mm -hmm. Well, he was punching holes in Daryl's bedroom door when he was a little baby sleeping. Mm -hmm. What kind of effect would that have on your system? He was on the road. He wasn't attuned to what the mother was doing to Daryl. So... That's the point that I'm so glad you started with ACEs, John, because because if we look at the, the questionnaire, which is 10 questions, it is, did your parents have alcoholism? Did, you know, his dad had, was an alcoholic. Was one of your parents um, have mental illness? Um, did one of your parents commit suicide? Is one of your parents in prison? Um, and now they're adding other questions. Do you live in extreme poverty? Um, so... Yeah, I was immediately starting to come up with a list of my own ace questions. It would be like, when you were tiny, did anyone scare the shit out of you? Or did anyone make you feel like like you didn't have a right to have a need? Or that that you weren't worth anything? Like Those are the kind of questions that really get at the heart of what it feels like to grow up with trauma. Yes, yes. And I, I remember when I interviewed Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who's in the film, and I asked him, what's the definition of trauma? And I thought he was going to say, when you're hit this many times or when you're sexually abused this many times. And he said, when you are not seen or known, that is the trauma. That's it. When you're not seen or known. Well, I, I had that. This is in the 50s, 60s, having a housekeeper who did love me and who touched me every single day. Um, and that's why they say I didn't turn out to be a, yeah. a, a criminal. That's exactly right. Can you tell the story of seeing Dr. Kotby for the first time and coming to recognize that this lifetime of symptoms traced back to something that you didn't even consciously remember at that time. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about <clears throat> when I was at Sierra Tucson last year, I learned so much about quote-unquote repressed memory. And I was told to think of it as like icons on a computer screen that we just quite haven't opened. Or in my case, my hands being slammed indoors me being locked in the car in the Florida sunshine, uh, me being hit with a hammer was my fault because my infant mind had to decide one of two things. Either I'm loved or I'm not. So I, I cannot, I'll die if I even think for a moment that I'm not loved. I'll die. I'm going to make up this story. It's preferable. It's preferable. To the way I understand it is that the, your child self says, Mommy, don't leave. I'm bad. You're right. I deserve this. Mm-hmm. Let me be on your team. And I'm a bad boy. Look, I'm going to start hitting myself to show you I'm on your side. Damn, that's smart. Yeah. 
Yes. That's really smart. It's a protective thing you did. To, to start to hate yourself is protective. That way the world doesn't hate you. Like you do it for them. It's safer. Wow. You know, my first day of school as a five-year-old after Murtis, our, our housekeeper, left, the first thing I did when I got to school was take care of business. For other kids, that made me getting a juice box and going to the playground. For me was, I, had, I, I walked up to someone and asked him if he'd like to hit me. Oh, my God. So that's the first order of business. Do you want to hit me? Because in my world, the only time my mother was nice was after she hit me or electrocuted me or did something to me. That's the only time she was like loving to me. The rest of the time, she, could, she wasn't even there. Um, and everyone says maybe that, you know, that's Munchausen by proxy or whatever, whatever her thing was, that's how I thought you got love. First, they have to beat you or stab you or cut you and then they will rescue mm -hmm. you. So, wow. um, yeah. Hence having a hard time in relationships. Yeah. The clinical diagnosis for that is, um, uh, it's a mind f mm -hmm. basically. That's how I describe it to my patients. Like, how do you live with that? Well, how confusing is that? Mm -hmm. That you have to be hurt to be loved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like there must have been some part of me that said, uh, one of these days I'm going to be an adult and that's what I'm, I'm planning for. And then you're going to pay for this. You will pay for this, you know? And I remember, you know, I, I had one therapist that said, you're thinking about doing harm to your parents. And I, I didn't actually understand that I really was. Um, and then my daughter was born and I was like, oh, well, I can't do it now. I mean, I, I can't be in jail and feed this baby. So my lifetime project. But, you know, you... I just watched a show called The Last Kingdom, and it's a lot about Vikings. And the Vikings talk about the pride and the glory and the sort of spirituality, spiritual value of killing your transgressor, getting that revenge. Not really understanding that in our society, that even the idea that revenge is a good solution is a trap, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's not the end goal. I find that I... Um, I have to, it depends on the type of person that's with me, but I do find that I have to help people claim the power of anger, mm -hmm. even if they don't act on it, to have a stance of saying, I don't deserve this ever again. Mm -hmm. It's such an important stance to be able to take. And that way you don't like let anyone else in your life mistreat you. And then once you're at that anger stage, then you have to melt that and go into the grief stage of what you've lost mm -hmm. through the injury and the hurt that you've experienced. It's interesting that when they died, that was first a grief and then an anger. Like, hey, have I been holding on to the fantasy all these years that I was going to get a do-over with my childhood? Was what? Hmm. I thought you guys were finally going to come around. Hmm. You with a hammer in your hand and you with a German Luger in your hand. You know? But you felt you moved from grief to anger? Is that I got mean? angry because I thought, hey, yeah. hey, I didn't get a childhood. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I was sort of clinging to this ridiculous notion. But, you know, one of the smartest things that anyone has ever said to me, like the, the, the casualty of war here, the symptom of the complex PTSD that I have had is the killing of the truth. That Dr. Copy said to me, he goes, you know, you're really here because you don't know how to tell yourself the truth. Because something happened to you when you were small that if you knew how to tell yourself the truth, you would have died. Growing up in my house, the thing that would kill you first before the knife was the truth. There was none of that. That was the end of the world, apocalyptic doom, never tell the truth here. And let awful things happen that we don't remark on, okay? We all know you're doing something to Daryl, and we all know you're doing something to his sister, but we're not going to talk about that. 
What a remarkable place. You know? I mean, my father with a German Luger in his hand talking about how he got that Luger in the first place. Just that night alone should have sent me to the nut house. You know, being a little boy going, wait, you, you said what to him before you killed him? Dad? <laughs> right? And I, I, you know, when my father sat on his deathbed, his last words, I let my anger be more important to me than my children. There was nothing as important to me. It was the only thing that was important to me. That's amazing that he said that. Yeah. You know, as I was listening to you as deeply as I could just now, and it, I was listening to uh, the way you moved. Like, when, I, when you first said anger from grief to anger, the word that I thought of that gives more nuance to your anger was more outrage. Like, I didn't get my childhood. Mm-hmm. And if you were in therapy with me, I would be like, stop, stop, stop. No, no further than this. Mm -hmm. And it's like I, am, I discovered an ember in like a smoldering thing. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that I want to cultivate. You still want whatever childhood represents, joy, simplicity, unadulterated, like engagement mm -hmm. with life and being surrounded by love. Mm -hmm. And I would want to like nurse that ember and cultivate that into like a goal for you. And then what happened was that you said that very fleetingly, and then it turned into the um, indignation and the, like, this is how, this is, I'm still mad. And this is all the mm -hmm. bad things that happened. Mm -hmm. This is the tricky thing about trauma. It's like um, people get stuck on the anger plane mm -hmm. and only see the bad things in the world. And they, they want to just fight all the bad things, but then they never learn to cultivate the aspirational things. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I reclaim a childhood, even though they're gone? you're still here mm -hmm. and you can have childhood in so many different ways and with your own child or with other people who like are childlike and yeah it seemed like the central thing michelle knows me better than i know myself i think and the central thing for me was and now we've identified that mental illness is not an airborne virus that it comes from somewhere very specific and in your case it came from this here's what happened i mean all the gyrations and the masterful work this man had, to, had to, to produce just to get to the truth. Now we've got it. Um, you're, you're this way because of something that happened to you. Well, what do we do with that, uh, that titanic rage? Mm -hmm. We had to move on to what is forgiveness and can you get it? Can you get some? You know, forgiveness not being for them, but for me. Yeah. Forgiveness not meaning I approve of you and I love you. Forgiveness really for me was letting go, setting sail, cutting that ship rope, so to speak. And in order to do that, we had to consider the preposterous notion that monsters are not born, they're made. That most of the monsters you hear about were victims. And then get into the case of my mom. What must have happened? You know, I think he said something like, you know, there's nothing more, something about healing for for that sort of murderous rage than a little sympathy for the devil. If you can just mm -hmm. feel it for a heartbeat. But God knows this is all heady stuff. Yeah. Right. But also it makes sense when instead of it just being about me and I believing I'm bad and that's why my parents did this to me, to have a moment where I see what happened to them and there is an actual reason why they are acting this way which had nothing to do with me just for that split second mm -hmm. that little space there just for a split second is, is, and suddenly yes i i was you know i've been living in in terror my whole life and just that in my case it, i had a dream and then during the dream but i woke up thinking the dream was real and for a second for a moment I felt a c compassion for my mother as a little girl. Mm. And that's the magic trick these great mm -hmm. doctors are able to spin, man. Yeah, and that's why it was important for me to to convey that this is a cycle and that the only way to break the cycle is to understand. It doesn't mean we exonerate the perpetrator, but if we vilify, we are never going to break the cycle. And 
you know, the 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 Michael Jackson documentary, it's great. It focuses on grooming, grooming kids, but there's not one mention that he was abused. Mm. And so now the discussion is, and everyone's talking about, do I listen to Michael Jackson's music? If that's what's come out of it, it's a failure. We can't just vilify. And as I said, we it doesn't mean exonerate. <laughs> and I believe that we are so afraid to feel any kind of compassion for a perpetrator because we think it means excuse and exonerate. And it, it, it doesn't mean that. But how are we going to break the cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle? There's um, there's two things that I was thinking about. The first one is that there's a trope in the trauma world which captures the intergenerational transmission of trauma very nicely. It's just that hurt people hurt people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the deeper thing that I want to say is um, trauma and like survival instincts, survival brain makes us want to bifurcate the world into you are good, you are bad. Yes. And the more stressed you are, the more you need to divide the world into simple terms. And um, what we're talking about is how do you hold on to the complexity of us as human beings who are both evil and good, Mm -hmm. right? And the way to like transcend the impact of stress and trauma is to be able to tolerate complexity as big as possible. And then the way that I do that and honor my anger about people getting hurt is that I'm not angry at individuals, but I'm angry at trauma itself and the way that trauma gets passed down. Like sometimes I will reify trauma and anxiety as like a separate thing. And I just get so angry whenever I see it in the room. And I get angry at my patients all the time. And I just, whenever I do though, it's because I can tell that their traumas are starting to hijack their brains. It's making them want to hurt themselves or hurt someone else. I'm just like, stop doing that. Mm. Stop being a prisoner to your trauma, and I'm going to fight for you, and I'm going to come rescue you. And if it means I'm going to get angry, you're going to have to put up with it because I care about you enough that I'm not going to let this happen anymore. Mm-hmm. I cannot abide by this anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where you put the anger. You use the anger for what it's designed to do, which is to help protect people. Mm. Yes, and I actually, I'm, I'm so grateful for you, Jacob, Dr. Hom, because I've never seen anybody work the way you do. Um, because I think that there's so many psychologists, doctors who have been trained to not show emotion. You're not supposed to get personally involved with your patient. And you, in, in, in the way that I watch you work and the videos that you post on your website, I see, oh, you can't help your patient unless you are intuitively working with them and feeling what they're feeling and feeling your own feelings as a doctor. Otherwise, you're just going to be sitting there nodding and saying something, intellectualizing it, mm-hmm. and then... Yeah, I find that that's a yeah. defense against feeling anything in the room whenever people get too intellectualized. And so the way that I feel like I can do the work that I do is that I have to allow hurt and pain to wash over me, and I have to learn to have metabolized my own history of abuse and hurt and pain so that I can like sit in that without being overwhelmed, without getting triggered myself, and then to somehow like help carry the load of hurt so that we're all just spreading it and holding it for each other and with each other. Mm-hmm. I love the idea to, to really come to an, a clear idea in my mind one day of what being triggered means. Maybe you could talk about the Hulk. That... Um, well... You, you, I thought you were an expert at it, the way that you talked about it in the movie. It was brilliant. Well, what, which thing did I say that I learned from what doctor? <laughs> well, there's a scene, there's the, a scene the in the film where, do you, do you mean uh, in the press conference when he gets triggered, when he's asked to... Oh, that's an interesting one. When, he, 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 when you're, you're at the press conference, you're about to give a, a talk... And then the woman says, it's time to go to the VIP reception. And you get triggered. I was talking about my father. Yeah. And you get upset and then you get triggered. Well, uh, to me, you know, and I'll say something that's probably wrong because I'm just now starting to surmise all the stuff I've learned in the past, just the past year about PTSD and complex PTSD. And at least with the complex PTSD, 
I don't need for anything to happen yeah. for me to feel awful. Yeah. Um, it's temporary, but it's real. And my friends, you know, I have a, me and my friend Elizabeth and Chelsea, you met, um, we text each other each day because we all suffer from it. Like we call it, you know, there's the show, um, Stranger Things about, mm -hmm. and they have the upside down where they go for no apparent reason. Yeah. The same world they were loving is now yeah. awful for no reason. So it's like, <clears throat> I'll tell them or they'll tell me or well, well, I'm, I'm in the upside down. Yeah. It's so subtle. And I, I just recently heard a label, emotional flashback, that really captures it. Because I think that, again, we focus so much on like uh, physical flashbacks. Like if a veteran sees like a pile of trash on the street and they think it's an IED mm -hmm. or like the fireworks, like those are all more obvious but for complex trauma, it's like um, as soon as you feel like any shame, I bet you that's a big trigger or threat of Well, see what you think of this. This is what I've learned this yeah. year and see if this makes any sense to you. That my, my system has a sort of day or moment per week when it prepares me to be raped again, to be tortured again to be beaten with a hammer again, yes. to be left alone in a park at the age of three again. Mm -hmm. And so I either feel so much fear I can't talk, or I feel so much rage I want to take it out on somebody. And I start having fantasies of, you know, if my mom were alive, boy, what would I do, right? That kind of anger. And then there's the third thing, which is the gazelle thing, the, the way a gazelle gets before it, it's killed. It's just not there. So it's almost as if my brain is doing military preparedness yes, drills. Exactly. The same way, there's not a real war going on, but we're going to stay ready in case there is. Now I get your question. So just in case this, yeah. because we don't know why that person walked in the room with a hammer yeah. to begin with. And now, and since we can't explain the damn, you know, my brain talking to me going, yeah. I can't explain it. I want to prepare you exactly. for it to happen again. The reason why you don't get triggers is that you don't need a trigger. Right. You're constantly living in threat. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. It doesn't happen. Michelle, you know me like the back of your hand. It's not all the time. Right. But it is a day or two a week. And it's not the whole day, thank God. Yeah. Are now, you aware of when you go into that mode? When I feel like I'm an awful person, it will never... I mean, my brain really will easily start using the words always and never. Yeah. Good. It will attach permanency to it. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 what is the the doctor Dr. Martin Seligman has the three P's? It becomes personal, pervasive, uh, and permanent. Mm -hmm. It's a magic trick. My brain is doing a magic trick. How could I feel that in the same on the same day in which me and Michelle were just in the park having a blast? It's my brain's going. Okay, well, just in case another one of those people comes in the room with a hammer. Exactly. You'll be you'll be ready. Exactly. And, and if you have to check out and die, you'll be ready for that too. Right. And that's why in the film you explain when you come out of it, because you say, when I think I'm being disrespected, when I think mm -hmm. I'm being, just even thinking that you're being disrespected could be such a trigger. And then you say, and then I realize you mean I'm not being killed? Like, okay, well, let's talk, it let's talk about it. It was a marvelous thing once I reached that level of, oh, my mom must have been horribly mistreated. I don't care about her anymore. I get it. I understand it. I don't love her, I don't, but it's over, and I'm going to move on with my life. So the first day where, you know, you, you know, I remember thinking to myself, looking at all, the, like when they left me out of the hospital, looking at all the people going, what do you do all day if you don't think you're going to get killed? Like, how do you spend your time? <laughs> Like, I'm serious. Like, really, you know, what do you do? Like, what, what kind of stuff do you get into? But, um... I, I, you play. Yeah, I guess. This is my Dr. Copy was saying, to just delight yourself. Delightful yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be stuff, like maybe Bach or Rolling Stone, anything. Yeah. Music, mm -hmm. art, Music. sports. Yeah. And, and being together, like... We'll get together at the coffee shop. We have a favorite coffee shop, and we'll get together with friends. And then Daryl always says, 
I'm going to be good for like the next two hours. <laughs> yeah, I get. I'm. I, I can literally. I have to do my own therapy, of course. You know, I still do cognitive therapy exercises, but I can go home symptom free, as if I never had it at all, mm. just for a couple of hours. You know. Yeah. You know, because my- our brains are wired to be in sync. So when we're in sync, we're together, we're seeing each other, the law we're of hearing mutuality, each other. The law of shared yeah. experience. My three Ps that are the opposite of the alarm Ps mm-hmm. are um, presence, poignancy, and purpose. And if you cultivate those instead of the other three Ps. Man, that's 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 the next, that's the, that's the final third of that's my life. That's the next frontier. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a brand new space uniform I'm going to have to get. Yeah, <laughs> but I just think, Darryl. I love the Hulk because I think, I want to hear about the whole. I think for the listeners, I think everybody can relate. And I think it's a good, it's such a great tool for people to stop beating themselves up when they do puff up. Um, You know that the Hulk was an abused kid, too? I didn't know he was abused. Doc Bruce Banner, you say? Yeah. Yeah. His father was abusive to him. His mother tried to stop the father from abusing him. The father uh, was also an alcoholic. And uh, one day, I think that the father killed the mother in front of the son. Uh, so he has domestic violence. He has child physical abuse. I'm assuming that he was bullied as a kid too, because he's like a smart kid. Um, and then he basically just started to develop rage, like we all do whenever we're trying. One time, in, a, in one of the fits of rage, he gets hit with gamma rays. Yes. And Which so, all the Marvel comic characters do. I know, right. It's the magic. <laughs> it's it's yeah. That's how you become superhuman. Yeah. And then suddenly his self-protective rage suddenly turns into the superhero. Mm. And and the reason why I love the Hulk is because Damn. as his is, rage as his rage increases, his IQ drops. Wow. He can't he has two word sentences. All he cares about is like who's in front of me that's trying to hurt me and how do I protect myself? And he can't speak, he can't think, he and he loses self-awareness. Uh, so he doesn't even know and he can't control it from happening. And the other thing I love is that he can't just turn it off on a dime. Once you're triggered, you need to expend all of, the, all of that energy, you need to make sure that you're safe, and then you go jump off to South America and go cuddle with Jennifer Connelly or whoever it is uh, Scarlett Johansson or whatever it is under a, a, that they show it in what magazine that year? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the cover of what magazine? And then you have to like sleep it off, because people with trauma have hyper fast triggers. Like they they have that hair trigger gun, mm-hmm. and then once they're activated, it takes them way longer to calm back down. And you just can't stop that. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the other thing I love about the Hulk is that he's not a villain. He's actually one of the most bad superheroes in the whole universe, right? Yeah. 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 And so, so, so many of us hate ourselves for having these rage episodes. And like you, you even said it just now. You said, "I'm going to be good for the next two hours." So you're already assigning whenever I'm raging, that's a bad thing. And when you were talking about that part, I was visualizing a little devil on your shoulder saying, "Don't put your guard down. People are coming to hurt oh, you." Oh, but he doesn't show up for two hours. I know he shows up for two days. Right. Yeah, but but what I'm the point being that there is a process involving mutual and shared experience, and all of my therapy, in which I actually feel great comfort. Yeah, for an hour or two. Wait, from what? From fellowshipping. Oh yes, of course, yes. But when he's starting to come up, you're probably like, oh, I wish you weren't here. I'm starting to get rageful. Mm-hmm. But instead, what I'm trying to do is to say, like, Hulk, you're back. You're, you think that I'm in trouble? Oh, thank you so much for loving me so much that you're trying to protect me. But you know what? I'm good. I'm good. She's not here. I got friends to meet. I need to go meet with them. I need wow, to be able to deep. speak. So Get thank you. Chills. Yeah, thank you for yeah, trying that's to protect chilling. me. But I got to do. Let me go So make play. friends with the Hulk? Make friends with the Hulk. Wow. That's deep. So when the Hulk <laughs> comes up. That's the title of your next book. <laughs> <laughs> make friends with the Hulk. Yeah. After all, he is a nice guy. He saved your life. Yeah. Well, what about when the Hulk comes up in a split second? Yeah, you kind of you just try to stretch that second out, and I still get triggered. I remember I still do petty, like retaliatory things, but I'm at least aware as I'm doing them. 
um, I, I made a point at the end of my notes to, to ask for thoughts or advice. Um, basically, what what does a good ally need to know, and how can mm. they help? What I need for myself is to for the people who love me to know that I I have a Hulk, and that sometimes he comes roaring out. And then as soon as the Hulk is gone, then I'm going to be back. But please don't mistake me for my Hulk. I think that's really important. Oh, man, I'm going to start going back to the, I'm going to go get the original Hulk. Where can you? <laughs> there's got to be able to buy that in New York. Yeah. I'm going to get the first 10, <laughs> ten episodes of um, comics. What are they? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we all either have our own trauma. We know somebody with trauma. We love somebody with trauma. We love somebody who doesn't know they have trauma yet, who doesn't remember their trauma. I mean, we're just all connected to it. I think love is the answer. And it shouldn't be thrown away like, oh, love. But let's not underestimate looking in somebody's eyes and listening and I think we always need to believe what is being said. And I think a sense of curiosity, which I've actually be learned. Be willing to believe. Yes, be willing to believe, even though it's hard and it's painful. So if you want to help somebody, just listen with, with curiosity. With an open mind. Yeah. Yeah, what would you say to your loved ones? Retreat. Turn back. <laughs> <laughs> Go the other way. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't even know how. Pe- there are certain people in my that have stayed in my life, <clears throat> and I think Michelle is one of them, who saw the difference between the Hulk, although I never heard it so aptly named, and me, and that somehow I don't know how go that uh, that's not even him it's not even him that's the hulk that's that side of him you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and somehow i've those are the only people that have been been able to keep around I, i think the thing about trauma that is somehow and and i don't know if we should even be calling it trauma anymore what what maybe there should be just hurt i just call it hurt hurt that our society wants it to go away they wanted to say Tell your story and let's be done. And that is something, it, it, it is a daily reprieve. So let's not judge ourselves and judge each other because if the hurt and the pain, the trauma is living inside the body. I mean, I've been in recovery for mine for 34 years. And two months ago, I remembered a whole new trauma. And it was severe. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked. I thought, I've remembered. I know everything. I've remembered everything. Mm -hmm. So this was living in my system, you know, for all of this time. And it really, I'm I'm, I'm glad it came out because it just reinforced this, all this research that I've been doing and doing for the film and now speaking about it. So... And, and I love how Jacob talks about how long it takes and how we have to be patient with ourselves and how doctors have to be patient with themselves and with each other and that there's no quick fix. And I think that that the reason that I love Daryl, I love Daryl's story, I think Daryl is the perfect messenger for the story is because he's telling the truth and I've never seen anyone be so vulnerable as Daryl. Yeah. And he's not pretending that uh, this happened to me and now I'm great. Mm-hmm. And it's not that he isn't great, but he's Sometimes willing. Sometimes I am. It, well, you're, it's just that we're always great. We're great even if we have a limp. <laughs> and, and I think that we have to help each other and, and help our society embrace our vulnerability. And then one final image that I keep having as I was listening to Daryl um, when saying, like, get away from me, get away, like, run. The thing I would do with you is that I would, like, grab you by the face and when you're in front of someone that loves you 
I would say, you are not going to hulk out right now. You're going to savor this. You're going to see how much this person loves you. And you're going to like experience gratitude. And, uh, you know, like the word grace comes up for me. It's like, I don't deserve this love, but it's still coming to me. And I'm just, you have to just be so thankful for that. And that's it. Like your brain is so entrained to think of fear and perpetrators. And you have to now intentionally train your brain to start savoring love, to let it come into you. And then for the people who love us and want to be there for us, don't give up and keep fighting. Like cultivate the frustration and anger to say like, no, Daryl, you're not running from me. Mm. Go back, doctor. <laughs> doctor, turn around. Yes, around. <laughs> Love it. Great. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all so, so much. This has been a real gift. Thank you so much, Michelle, Daryl, and Dr. Hom, for this conversation. After we did this recording, I started seeing childhood trauma everywhere. Like Michelle said, it really does touch us all. But I also started seeing opportunities for resilience and healing. Seeking out trauma-informed doctors like the one that saved Daryl's life is a big one. And then there are the ideas that came up in our conversation, like make friends with the Hulk. Or how about the part where Daryl talked about forgiveness, setting sail, as he called it. Michelle's advice also struck a chord. Look into a person's eyes, listen, and be willing to believe, even though it's painful. To learn more about Michelle's film and how you can host a screening for your school, organization, or community, please visit crackedupmovie.com. We'll include a link in the show notes, along with some resources where you can learn more about childhood trauma in general. Road to Resilience is a production of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. It's made by me, Katie Ullman, and Nikki Hudson. Our executive producers are Dory Klesis and Lucia Lee. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes and recommend us to a friend. We really appreciate it. I'm John Earl. See you next month with more stories from The Road to Resilience.